Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest U.S. regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. Hey, Robert, uh, thanks for agreeing to have me on. I know that uh, I'm probably not somebody you've heard of in detail before. So I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, yeah, of course, well, you know, we like to talk to the billionaires and the plebs alike. So it's all the same to me. Yeah. Um, Web through and through. <laughs> nice. So maybe, you know, by way of introduction, you could start by just giving me a little bit of professional background on yourself from an audience so they know who you are and where you're coming from. Absolutely. So I am 41 years old, born in the state of Iowa. Um, I moved to Tennessee in 2002 and since then have moved up through various industries. Um, you know, like any teenager fresh out of high school, I worked uh, retail and fast food for a while, um, graduated to auto manufacturing once, once I moved here to Tennessee, um, became a personal trainer for a brief period to try to uh, look like less of a nerd, um, then uh, got a job at uh, Dell Technologies uh, here in Nashville. So for the last seven years, I've been uh, in various roles there. Uh, and today, as we record this, I'm a pre-sale solution architect for enterprise class businesses. Very cool. So, so, I have a sorry, go ahead. good amount of experience in the technology industry. Got it. So did that, was that part of your journey into Bitcoin? Was just the technical path or, you know, maybe you could just give us the, the backstory on how you first heard about Bitcoin and how you ultimately got into it. Yep. So I've been a techie all my life. Um, you know, my dad bought one of the first IBM computers uh, to be released, and I spent my time taking that thing apart. Um, and then, you know, from then on, it was uh, me and my own computers and eventually building my own computers once that market uh, opened up uh, and competitors emerged into it. So, you know, I've always been a, a hardware guy at heart, you know, um, deeply appreciative of the, the Tim the Toolman Taylor, you know, power um, philosophy. So, you know, bringing that to the IT industry and understanding how the, the foundation of everybody's applications and workflows work uh, really led me into a place where I could uh, spot trends emerging in the industry. Um, so one of the things I correctly anticipated was like Apple's move to their own uh, internally produced silicon based on RASC technology. Um, and I see another such trend coming with Bitcoin, and I want to help as many people get on top of it as I can. You mentioned Tim, the tool man, Taylor, who was the main character in that sitcom. I forget the name of the sitcom. Uh, it was Home Improvement. Home uh, Improvement. Big That's in the right. Midwest in the rural 90s. Yeah, yeah. That, I remember watching and that then show the, There a was kid. a sensible sidekick, Al Borland. Great show. I have never heard of that one, but used to watch Home Improvement. Uh, it was quite funny. He's the guy with the obnoxious laugh, right? Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not sure. 
about his power philosophy though that you just mentioned is that something you could you wouldn't mind unpacking for us it's uh you know whenever he's working in the shop on some project he would always bring out the uh the super souped up version of the project Mm. whatever it was you know whether it was a you know a souped up lawnmower that could you know cut through a tree or something like that he always had a an over the top you know what happens if we make this thing as powerful as possible and you know it would always be the you know, more power, oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah. you know, just that Tim, the tool man grunt. Got it. No. Okay. That makes sense. I found so a what, lot of appreciation in that growing up. So what does that, how do you map that power philosophy onto technology? What's the re- relationship there? But it, it kind of goes back to Moore's law, which has held pretty steady since the, the tech industry kind of dawned. And that's the, the principle that, you know, every, so often two or three years the amount of computer processing power available in a power package will double or thereabouts Um, so that's a trend that's continued through today although there have been some development periods where that hasn't quite been the case Um, but you know I, i associate that with the way the internet came up in the early 90s you know computers started out pretty monolithic not a lot of differentiation but over time, you know, the market grew and expanded and more feature sets were offered. And then the same thing on the Internet. You know, the, there was the Wild West Internet of the 90s and then the more corporatized Internet of the uh, period after 2006. Um, and then now we're at the dawn of the Bitcoin era. And, you know, we can barely imagine how it's going to change. Um, I think it's a really exciting industrial opportunity. Yeah, I agree with that. There's... It's such a big deal that we, it doesn't fit inside of most people's worldview, honestly, like the idea of money. Well, I guess the idea of gold becoming digital or dematerialized, you know, we were so dissociated from the significance of gold, even though it's still, it it runs the world. Basically he who has the gold makes the rules even through to today. So, um, it's like people don't have the, I guess, scope of understanding to, if gold doesn't fit into your worldview, you don't understand the significance of gold and the world of power and geopolitics, then you're sure as the hell not going to understand the significance of digital gold. Um, and I think that's why so many people struggle with Bitcoin. And, you know, hopefully on this show, at least I'm trying to just highlight that question to get people to make you know incorporate gold as part of their understanding of the world the significance of it across history and in doing so you're better equipped hopefully to understand the relevance of digital gold yeah and uh, i agree with every bit of that um i think and i've had a lot of success with this particular argument that i'm about to make is you know, equating the old fiat standard, you know, the dollar with the the imperial system of measurement, measurement, right? Mm-hmm. You know, feet, yards, etc. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin is the metric system, so we're trained to think in imperial, and Bitcoin is metric. So you really have to teach yourself to think in a different way, you know, a way that adheres to the the five properties of hard money, which you've expounded on before. Hmm. Yeah, it's. I've heard that analogy before, like the metric system of money. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, although I did get schooled the other day by a Brit, Dominic Frisbee. And he was saying that the imperial system of measurement is actually better because it emerged bottom up. Where like a, you know, a foot is the average size of someone's foot with a boot on. And an inch is like a thumb's width. And there's all these uh, kind of common everyday uses that culminated into this imperial measurement system and then he said by contrast the metric system what we call in the u.s the metric system was just this intellectualized top-down thing that got imposed everywhere else um that really flipped things on its. well let me let me say something about that yeah so there's a there's a uh, a language developed by the the seti people called Linkos, and it's a language based on math. And it operates much the same way that ordinary language does. It just uses mathematical expressions in order to convey meaning, Mm -hmm. um, which is part of what 
Bitcoin does, of course, it allows us to convey speech as transactions across the internet. So, you know, as far as, sorry, uh, incoming call there. Sorry. Um, but as far as, you know, Imperial versus metric, I, I see Imperial is more of a, a personal system of measurement. You know, you're measuring how many feet you can walk, how, how many inches can you jump, you know, how many, uh, how many balls can you juggle? But with the metric system, then you're thinking in terms of industry. You know, how far can this car go on this amount of power? Mm. Uh, you know, how many Satoshis does it take for me to purchase this thing that I want? Uh, it's all about the increments that we can use uh, to group value together to uh, acquire the things that we desire. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, it was a big uh, inversion for me because I had always grown up thinking that the United States just resisted the movement to a more efficient system of measurement. <laughs> um, but apparently, yeah. um, there's, are there's you familiar else. with uh, familiar with the physicist Eric Weinstein? Of course. Yeah, Eric's been on he, the show. He proposed the, he, he proposed the new theory, uh, I believe, where he described uh, dimensions 5 through 11 as a series of rulers and protractors that we use to evaluate our stance in the universe, something like that. I'm not super into the physics of it. But, you know, I took that to mean that humans operate in three dimensions, you know, whether it's our proprioceptive capabilities or it's our... Uh, uh, mental calculation capabilities, you know, we have, we have the ability to think abstractly about certain things. So the more we know about any given subject and multiple related subjects, the more we can form a cohesive uh, neural network that draws together all of our points of interest. And if that sounds a lot like how AI works, that's, well, one, it's because that's the way AI is modeled, you know, on the human brain. Mm -hmm. But um, we haven't got quite to the point where AI is ready to take over any of that with any type of reliability. Right. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So what you said, you mentioned before the show, you got into Bitcoin, but it was the work of safety and a moose and others that influenced your thinking about Austrian economics. What, could you maybe just, Explain to me a bit how that intellectual journey has been for you. Is that pre Bitcoin or post Bitcoin that you that you got into Austrian econ? Uh, it was actually pre Bitcoin. So I first was exposed to the ideas of Austrian economics through the Ron Paul campaign of two thousand seven, two thousand eight, mm -hmm. uh, and that was right before the financial collapse of the same period. So, you know the. The, the Good Doctors campaign, followed by that immediate crash of the financial and housing markets, you know, that really drove it home for me that, you know, this is a logically derived truth. And these principles are sound in theory and in practice. And then, you know, in 2012, I heard of Bitcoin and I said, well, I, I've always been skeptical of new technology. So I tend to wait and see before I get involved into anything too deeply. So I missed the, uh, the early early, early train. But, you know, in 2016, I kind of looked back at it and saw that it was uh, gaining in steam and popularity and influence. And about 2018, 2019, I realized that it was going to be a thing. And since then, I've been doing whatever I can to improve myself so that I can, you know, help fight this battle that needs to be fought against uh, the central banks and, you know, those that support them. Very interesting. Was there a particular epiphany or light bulb moment you had with Bitcoin and or Austrian economics? Uh, yeah, it was uh, Dr. Saifedean's, uh the work on the fiat standard. He, he references Rothbard and uh, Mises and some of the other writers uh, extensively in the work. Uh, the, the list of citations that he went through to put all this together was amazing. Um, so it really got to me when I realized that the result of my poor health was mostly because of the fiat food structure and uh, the food that they have us eating. Um, as soon as I started to follow a, a primarily meat diet and limit uh, everything else to, you know, very few carbs, no seed oils, that kind of thing, 
in, in the last six months, I have made significant progress in my physical health. That's great to hear. I've had personally been on quite the health journey as well. And the paleo slash carnivore diet has been very impactful um, in helping me get things straightened out. And it seems like that's true for a lot of people. Anyone that's got any chronic issue going on, um, I definitely suggest you check it out, do some research and see if it's a fit for you. This is a really good, first of all, it's a diet we've had for millions of years, and it's really good at reducing inflammation. And inflammation is the either causative or contributory to basically every human pathology. So in this diet that you can reduce a lot of inflammation um, can really just work wonders in your life. So glad to hear you've been down that journey as well. <laughs> um, so for the audience, it's just on audio. You're wearing a hat that says taxation is theft. And this is a common libertarian phrase. Um, people outside of libertarianism often, <laughs> I guess, get rubbed the wrong way about this. And they typically typically initiates arguments about who would build our roads and who would do this and who would do that. Um, what is your, what is your basis of explanation behind that phrase? If someone sees you wearing that hat and they say, Hey man, I don't think taxation is theft. How do you handle that discussion? Yeah. So I, I like to reference the work of, uh, Michael Malice, who I understand you've spoken with, um, he has I actually have not spoken with Michael. Malice. Done a good deal of thinking. Oh well, um, I highly recommend his work, uh, particularly his new book, The Anarchist Handbook. It's a series of essays on libertarian thought collected into a cohesive narrative. Uh, it's designed to lead one down the path of, you know, statism to whatever degree you subscribe to it to. Uh, individualist anarchism, or like you would say, uh, freedom maximalism. Mm. Uh, so that's the idea that nobody has the right to infringe or harm a peaceful person, and there are no exceptions, including agents of government. Mm. So taxation being the method of funding government, uh, based on that first principle, taxation is extortion, and extortion is uh, the... Uh, expropriation of property under the threat of coercion. Um, therefore, taxation is theft. Um, and there's a whole school of thought that's been put under that, that heading. Um, but the, the truth of it is, you know, at the end of every law that the government passes, there is a gun pointed at you waiting for you to disobey. Um, they may not enforce it all that effectively uh, at this point, but you know, as we've seen over the last two years, it, it only takes a, a crisis that may not even be a major issue uh, to be blown up out of proportion by uh, a compliant corporate media. And then, you know, we're, we're stuck in our houses for two years uh, after two weeks to slow the spread. So I, I, I have a hard time trusting anybody that tells me that taxation is anything other than theft, especially after two years of our lives were taken from us. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people are waking up to this reality uh, in light of recent events um, globally, really. Uh, you know, governments globally who are engaged in this, um, this coercion, right? It's widespread coercion to, to lock people in their homes. Is There's no other term for it. Um, so look, you... Okay. Taxation is theft. I agree clearly. I often just describe it as look, if you can't say no in a transaction, if you don't have the the ability to walk away or change service providers or renegotiate, and that literally the, the power of saying no or renegotiating is taken away from you at the tip of a gun, as you said, basically it's do this or else, pay me this amount of money or else. Obviously that's theft. Yeah. I don't know how else it's obvious. It just I guess it's so ubiquitous in the world that people just take it as a, you know, a way of nature. The, even the resignation to it is articulated in that old adage, the two certainties in life are death and taxes. Yeah. People just have resigned themselves um, to theft. Yeah. And, being... you know, 
part of reality. In, in part, it's in part we're limited by being U.S. citizens because where can we go that's better? There are very few places that don't have rigid immigration standards. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, Switzerland or Japan or New Zealand. You know, any any country that has more economic freedom or personal freedom than the U.S. It's very difficult to get in. And then you have to go through the, the rigmarole of renouncing your U.S. citizenship and paying the exit tax. Mm-hmm. So they won't just let you leave. Before you can leave, they take their cut. Right. So, you know, uh, I don't know if you know comedian Dave Smith. He, he's yeah. a staunch libertarian. Um, he had the, the comments, and I don't know if it was his originally or if he uh, adapted it, but he said that, you know, the, the U.S. federal government is a mafia masquerading as a human rights organization. Yeah. And taxation is their money laundering scheme. And uh, Ukraine is their human trafficking organization. Wow. No, I did not hear that. But that definitely pulls together a lot of notions in one quote. That's a, that's a good one. Um, so you have some ambitions in the Bitcoin space, you mentioned earlier that you intend to run for governor of Tennessee in 2026. Do you feel mm-hmm. dissonance at all about trying to run for a political office or a state office and at the same time believing that taxation is theft? I mean, how do you square those two things? Well, let me tell you the five things that would be my immediate priorities as governor of Tennessee. You know, um, number one is to transition the state of Tennessee entirely to Bitcoin as a uh, reserve standard. Uh, The second would be to uh, do whatever I can to bring more nuclear power opportunities to the state. Um, And, you know, because nuclear power produces so abundantly, Uh, There's great opportunity there for vertical integration with both the IT data center industry and the Bitcoin mining industry. So if we can put those two sets of infrastructure right on top of nuclear power generation, then we can run the Bitcoin network essentially for free and make the network more secure by growing the number of nodes. Um, And then the, the other things that I would bring to Tennessee would be an immediate end to the federal drug war. We would simply refuse to enforce it any longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cannabis, psilocybin, LSD, um, you know, the, uh, the gentle psychedelics would be um, free and available in the state of Tennessee, uh, you know, for many people with a, a doctor's order because, you know, these substances can be dangerous and we certainly want people to use them responsibly. But, you know, if you go into any experience with these substances, with the proper research and, you know, the, the appropriate intention, uh, whether it's to improve yourself or uh, resolve some deep seated issue that you have, um, these substances can be used to great benefit. Now, whether you personally need, you know, uh, psychological therapy alongside that is, is a question between you and your doctor, I believe. So, you know, that's another place where I think decentralization matters. Um, the corporate medicine scheme, I, I was a victim of it all my life. So I, I'm glad to see things coming up like a Bitcoin operated uh, health share and mutual aid uh, businesses like uh, crowd health. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's yeah. a great one. Um, And then, you know, of course, there are alternatives to taxation. You know, we've come a long way from the idea that government is a necessary evil. Um, I think that our technology and our our, uh, understanding of how human development works means that we've come far enough that we can say that government isn't a necessary evil any longer. Uh, There is no function that is performed by government other than physical security that cannot be accomplished by software. Right. Yeah, well said. And we, <clears throat> yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts around this and I hope to compile them into a book, but I just sort of to say it simply, it seems to me like the government or statism perhaps was, I'm going to, I'm going to say necessary evil, but I don't know that it was entirely necessary per se, or it was just people being opportunistic. Like if you can get in a position of power and have other people do your bidding, if that option's available, there are people that will take that option. 
So I don't know that it was necessary per se, but in that we lacked the technology to do these other functions, it created an opportunity for people to position themselves into the ruler class over the ruled. And that's essentially what we've inherited, I think, with the state model. Um, but, yeah. you know, technology changes that, of course. Now I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible. And then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. So where do you see these integration points between Bitcoin and the tech industry more broadly? And how would you aim to facilitate them uh, in your role as governor? So a little bit of IT background, you know, there, there was a traditional internet, which was the seven layers of operation that were between the user and the application. Um, so the corporate internet simplified all of that into two or three networking layers, uh, whether it's the user, the business and the outcome. Um, so I see Bitcoin going along kind of the same evolutionary path. You know, we, we started with the, the single celled organism and you know, Lightning and other networks that are built around Bitcoin provide the, the evolutionary leap that we need to scale Bitcoin far beyond its singular, uh, singular capability. Um, and then of course you can build other layer three, layer four, layer five tertiary services that all interconnect and operate in the background. Um, I think this plays into AI in that there will be some algorithmic control behind it, but I'm a staunch advocate of putting any type of AI or machine learning or algorithmic tool directly into the hands of the user and let, their, let them tweak their own outcome. Hmm. Um, I, I, I've been through all of the, uh, the trainings at my job and I, I find that I don't agree with much of the corporate cloud or uh, centralized AI development models. I, I think they're doomed to failure uh, just by nature of centralization. Hmm. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Or, um, Well, I, you know, I want to talk more about AI with people that know more than I do because I don't know enough. But just on instinct, it seems to me that if we get to general purpose AI, that if the schematics of that AI are open source and available to all, then that could be a real boon for humanity. Could radically improve our productivity. I mean, the rough use case I imagine is everyone just having their own personal assistant, right? This general AI that knows you better than anyone else and it can do a lot of things for you all the time, make your life a lot easier. That seems to make a lot of sense, but on the flip side, 
So you, you're, I think you're where I am when it comes to AI. You want something like Tony Stark's Jarvis, you know, the, the digital yeah. personal assistant that, you know, is, is your shield against, you know, the, the undesirable aspects of what's out there. Yeah. And hopefully I, I like have a Ultron. lot of that same. Yeah. Not Ultron. We don't want Ultron. Right. Um, but I, I think the way that we get to Ultron is actually through state or corporate control. Um, have you ever seen on YouTube, there's a channel called dust and they have a uh, great sci-fi short videos. Uh, there's a video that they've made called slaughter bots. And it's basically about, you know, the introduction of weaponized drones and how they will eventually run out of control through hacking or pirating of the hardware mm -hmm. and result in uh, urban wars between uh, groups of collectivists, essentially. It, it's a dystopian film and it runs about 10 minutes and it tells uh, what I think is a very chilling story about what happens when uh, technology is used to harm people rather than make their lives better. Hmm. Well, I haven't seen that. Um, but just to finish what I was saying, if, if alternatively general purpose artificial intelligence is a, it emerges as a closed source tech stack, that I think is really scary because whoever is in control of that architecture would just have the ultimate weapon in the world right if you alone or your exactly. conglomerate or country or whatever it is if you, any individual centralized organization that controls artificial general purpose intelligence would have a huge asymmetric advantage over everyone else um that's scary yep. so it's you know again i'm back to this outlook on the digital age where it seems like the spectrum of possibilities for the human species is just wide open we could totally veer towards this dystopian you know closed sourced ai situation or we could veer towards this more utopian i hate to use that word because utopian aspirations always end in their opposite but let's say a less dystopian future uh, built on honest money and hopefully open source tech stacks across the board, including for AI. Um, but like I said, I need to talk to uh, people smarter than me about that to clarify my thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Lex Friedman would be a great option. He's deep into the AI world. Uh, he's given several courses at MIT, uh, very smart guy. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, you, most of the AI resources and experts are at the, you know, the, the corporate tech companies at this point. So uh, there's a lot of captive talent there uh, working on the, the corporate AI models. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think we could easily end up in, you know, a situation where we've got, you know, global digital surveillance. Um, and, you know, that seems to be one of the goals of, you know, the, the people trying to put together a, a one world government. So I'm, I'm not a fan of that at all. Mm. Uh, I think the trend uh, of human intera interaction needs to be, you know, further decentralized down to the point where, you know, we, we can operate peacefully, you know, based on free and equal exchange rather than the fear of violence at uh, the hands of, you know, somebody that woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Um, so we're recording this in early June 2022. And before we started, you mentioned there was a takeover of the Libertarian Party recently. Um, would you like, I don't know anything about this. So please tell me, please enlighten me. Yeah. So back in 2006, um, the party was essentially taken over by what they called the Portland massacre, uh, wherein the, the platform of the party was changed to the kind of the forerunner of the woke ideology. You know, they, they included the phrase, uh, we condemn bigotry as irrational and repugnant. Um, and from that stems the, the growth of the, the woke ESG types within the Libertarian Party. Uh, that eventually uh, culminated in their control of the national party. Um, so several former chairs had been essentially caught with their pants down 
uh, rigging uh, state party primaries and conventions uh, to try to maintain power. Uh, and that's from this new caucus that was started in 2017, uh, the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus. Um, so these are the free market people, the, the Ron Paul uh, disciples of 2008, you know, kind of come back around to say, you know, we're, we're tired of this corporate uh, woke nonsense. Um, we don't believe that we need to be split into groups and pitted against each other. Uh, we much prefer to operate as individuals uh, toward mutual, uh, mutual benefit for ourselves, each other, all of humanity. Um, now, of course, you, you can't reject woke ideology without uh, being attacked by the mob. And, you know, that, that happened to the Mises Caucus. Uh, there, there were several indiscretions in the youth of several of the, the people involved on the Mises Caucus. Uh, you know, Tom Woods, uh, Scott Horton, um, Jeff Dice, uh, Lou Rockwell, uh, the folks that run the, the Mises Institute in general. You know, they, they suffered the typical woke attacks of, you know, they're, they're racist, they're, they're bigoted, they're uh, what have you, the flavor of the, whatever the insult is, um, whether it was true or not, you know, the, the woke types don't mind just making stuff up. So the messaging of the LPMC from then to today has been very consistent in terms of, you know, what they believe as far as, you know, liberty and economics and just cultural aspects of society in general. So, Last weekend over Memorial Day, all of this culminated in a convention where the entire LNC leadership was replaced with Mises Caucus uh, candidates, including the new chair, Angela McArdle. Um, I like her a lot. I'm actually talking to her later this week about a Bitcoin committee for the LNC. Uh, I would like to see the, the LP come more fully into the Bitcoin community. And you know, she's absolutely someone you would want to talk to you if you want to understand how libertarian messaging will change going forward. Yeah, I, and it's part of the reason I chose the term freedom maximalist is to distinguish myself from the confusion, actually. Libertarianism is essentially, I share the same values with, with pure libertarians, but the fact that it's become a political party is kind of um, a self-defeating it doesn't make any sense, right? If you're an actual libertarian, you want low to no government. You don't want to be a party <laughs> in government. Yeah. So, and I've I've gradually arrived at that same conclusion, right? You know, why do we have a national libertarian party at all? Right. You know, why why can't we have a confederation of state libertarian parties? Um, I think that would probably be more effective. And then you know the various caucuses could operate nationally, and and the state parties could you know handle state level party operations. You know, there's still ample opportunity for coordination between state parties, state chapters on issues, you know, like the drug war, cannabis, mm -hmm. uh, ending the foreign wars, uh, all of the things that libertarians uh, see as being wrong with the federal establishment and want to curtail. Um, so, you know, going back to what you said at the beginning about, you know, why would a libertarian want to run for governor of a state? You know, it's, it's to more aggressively call for decentralization. You know, I don't want to be a politician. I would much rather that we had no need for politicians. Mm. But, you know, the way things are going, you know, everybody has to stand up at some point and do something. So I'm going to use whatever opportunity I get to tell people about Bitcoin, uh, about Austrian economics. Um, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to help people get healthy, to, you know, reclaim control of their health, their lives, their finances. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, I, I'd love to form a Bitcoin startup, you know, to, you know, make the, the next generation of Bitcoin innovations, because there, there's still much more to come in the Bitcoin world. You know, the final Bitcoin won't be mined until year 2140. Uh, chances are both you and I will be deceased at that point. So, you know, we're, we're really trying to build something for our children, our grandchildren and our descendants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's why I'm here and that's what I believe in. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing. That's beautifully said. Um, and 
I agree. You know, we've got to fight the fight at every level. And that includes the traditional forums that we have, right? Which for, I would say for better or worse, but I'd say it's largely for the worse, this giant political apparatus that runs the world, right? We've got to infiltrate and and fight it there too. Yeah. And you know, while we're at it, there's no reason that we can't modify and modernize these platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we said earlier that, you know, taxation and central government, central banking, they're, they're largely obsolete. I, I think that, you know, we should push to do whatever we can in software, open source, open platforms. I, I'm all for, you know, the, the public availability of knowledge and information that'll better humanity. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, I actually am a big opponent of the IP and copyright system in general. Um, mm-hmm. I think that it's been twisted far too much um, to the benefit of the uh, the institutions and the others that hold that centralizing power. So you said IP, you know, right? Intellectual after we property. tackle money, yeah. After yeah. we tackle finance, we should definitely be looking at IP as the next thing to fix. Yeah, it's a giant scam, um, which again, Austrian economics turns it over at first principles. You can't own an idea exclusively, right? An idea, when you share an idea, you haven't given up possession of it. It's a non-scarce thing, right? You have the idea and then you've shared it with someone else. Now they have the idea. So yeah, the idea of owning ideas is a bad idea, I guess we might say. Um, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot to be done, but um, it's great that we have Bitcoin, man, because without Bitcoin, I just don't think there would be a good check against all these systems of oppression. Um, And that means we would probably be driving off a cliff for sure as a civilization without Bitcoin. But at least with Bitcoin, there's the hope of getting this thing under control. Yeah. And, you know, that's a good reason to keep an eye on the Bitcoin bill that Senator Lummis just announced today. Um, Anybody with an interest in Bitcoin and keeping Bitcoin free uh, should definitely be involved with their, you know, their political representative, their legislatures at every level. Um, You know, especially given the urges from the ESG types to change Bitcoin to proof of stake. Um, that's uh, a place where I think we need to draw the line. Um, changing Bitcoin to proof of stake would essentially destroy the security of the network and, you know, allow the failing institutions to jump ship to uh, essentially a, a new digital version of what they have now, uh, whether it's through CBDCs or proof of stake. So yeah. I, I staunchly oppose both of those as well. As do I. And then again, fortunately with Bitcoin, even if such a law were passed, it it would be largely unenforceable because ultimately each of us runs the node software that chooses the rules that are most relevant and advantageous to us. So political governance has zero to no impact on node governance. I... I wouldn't leave it just like that. Uh, I think that, you know, given what we said at the beginning where, you know, government at the end of every government law is the barrel of a gun. You know, if if the edicts start and Bitcoin is banned and they're tracking people through power usage, you know, through cell phone records, through location data, all of the things we know they do because of the NSA leaks by Snowden. Uh, You know, they could potentially perform no-knock raids on any Bitcoin miner. Uh, They could order the shutdown of institutional miners. So, you know, the the threat of government's overreach is real. And I know that there will always be a black market for Bitcoin mining, and I'm grateful that that's the case. But too often when we allow government overreach to create black markets, it results in violence boiling over into society. Mm. Uh, We saw it during alcohol prohibition in the early 1900s. Uh, We've seen it with the federal drug war. Uh, I don't think humanity can afford to have the financial wars devolve into a hot war. Mm. I agree with that. Um, But it does seem as though we are on that path. 
and typically these things get worse before they get better so um yeah yeah ever-present threat of government overreach and oppression agreed with all of that um i guess my again my point would just be that the governance model of bitcoin is designed to deal with those eventualities so even with these no-knock raids and shutdowns of bitcoin miners still really hard to tell individual nodes which version of bitcoin to run all right so ultimately the social layer will always select the money that works best for them and clearly that's never going yeah. to be point of or I'm sorry proof of stake anything proof of work is what gives bitcoin supply cap integrity and credibility so um I'm not saying I'm not trying to discount the threat. I agree with all that. I'm just saying that at least we have countermeasures in place with Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I, I give all credit to Satoshi, you know, whoever they may be, you know, the, the system from an engineering perspective is so well thought out, so secure, so redundant that, you know, I, I don't see a way for it to be destroyed unless they just give the order to shut off the internet entirely. Mm. Um, that's the only thing that I could see taking down the network at this stage. So, you know, that, that's a huge white pill for me because it means that, you know, some portion of human knowledge and human history will survive even if the worst does happen. So what were you saying would be the one thing you think it could take out the entire network? I'm sorry. I missed that. Uh, if the government gave the order to turn off the internet, uh, you know, the, the government does have a kill switch for the internet. Mm. The, the CIA leaks uh, from WikiLeaks delved into that quite deeply, uh, all the tools that they have at their disposal. So, you know, we, we all know what happened to Kennedy, right? Mm. Um, so there, there's always risk, but I, I remain hopeful. And I believe that you know fighting for decentralization in you know the, the physical world is just as important as keeping bit bitcoin decentralized in the digital sphere yeah so I, I think we can at least agree on that for sure so there is a kill switch for the internet i assume this is just for north america you're saying well i mean you you could uh, separate the internet into regions by cutting the ocean cables uh, yeah. the cables that connect the internet between yeah. the oceans uh, then you essentially isolate the continents and then, you know, the, the corporations and the governments uh, being in bed as they are. Uh, I, I imagine the corporations and the uh, security uh, enforcers would be very compliant with a government order to curtail Internet usage. Right. Um, you know, it sounds crazy up front, but in 2019, nobody imagined they'd be locked in their homes for a year. So yeah, at this point, I'm not willing to discount the possibility. No, I agree with you. Um, all, all bets are off, so to speak, when the nation state model faces an existential threat, basically. So I'm sure they're going to, you know, they're willing to go to whatever links they can to protect it. Um, I would just add that again there, even if in that worst case scenario, you're axing internet connections between continents and then heavily regulating internet usage within continents still not enough to kill the bitcoin network could definitely hamper it a lot but not enough to kill it or turn it off so again my only point there would be there are there you know bitcoin's designed for this basically designed to be banned designed to be attacked yeah. um yeah and unless we figure out a way to just totally disable the internet everywhere forever then I don't think there is a there's an attack vector that can really take it down, at least not a known one. Well, uh, multiple simultaneous EMP bursts in the atmosphere would kill any unprotected uh, electronic equipment. Mm -hmm. um, you can't achieve that kind of thing by detonating nuclear warheads in the atmosphere. But the impact of that event on life on earth would be apocalyptic so yeah. you know it's a lose-lose for everybody so hopefully there's nobody crazy enough to do it 
Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask if you actually think a, uh, anyone would take it that far. I mean, that would be the ultimate cutting off your not nose to spite your face. I, I agree, and I, I remain hopeful, as I said, but I've been proven wrong a lot in my life. So I've I've learned not to, you know, make an assumption until I see the body, so to speak. Yeah, well, well said, as have I been proven wrong a lot. So, and, you know, as we said, this huge possibility space in front of us with the digital age, the right response to that is more humility. Because if you thought you were wrong before, just wait till things keep changing exponentially faster every year into the future. You're going to be more and more yeah. prone to error, I think. Yeah. So... Brandon, man, this is a cool conversation. I didn't expect us to go off on these tangents, but I think they're really interesting. I think people will like it. Um, could you please let my audience know where they can find out more about you or your work? Uh, absolutely. So I'm mostly on Twitter at this point, uh, and you can link to it in your show notes page, but it's the real brand MCN. Um, ran into the character limit on Twitter. Um, I also have a Substack, uh, extrapolation.substack.com. Uh, I've got some old articles posted there, but I'm getting ready to revamp my content and begin to uh, focus more on Bitcoin. Um, you know, I'll intersperse some culture and some politics in there, but mostly uh, I believe that Bitcoin is the thing that will ultimately bring humanity together. So that's where I'll spend my efforts. Beautiful. Well, thanks so much, man. Really enjoyed this and uh, look forward to talking again sometime. Yeah, likewise, Robert. Uh, it's great to meet you. And uh, maybe at the next Bitcoin conference, we can have lunch. Sounds good. Thanks again.